To God be the glory. <coughs> For just a little while here, I'm gonna, as we all know, that we're still in the in the mindset or of um, growth. You know, this is what it's all about. Come on, man. Uh, we can't continue uh, living, uh, hoping. There's no. It, it, we just got to get it done. Uh, the Lord has called us for such a time as this, and, and we need to. God bless you, man. Um, I'm so glad everybody's here. And real quickly, the, la the ladies were singing today, man. There was a song I think they're, they're practicing in. I was in the office, and I, I had to jump out of my seat and start stomping my feet, man. That's heavy stuff, you know. And uh, so they're going to be bringing that to us soon. It's an amazing song. But uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, God wants us, uh, well, here, let me just, I'm trying to find it. But thank God for Sister Kathy brought me a nice, big <laughs> Bible. Amen. So, I don't want you to go through this, she said. So, she went ahead and bought me this Bible. Chapter 4 and verse number 15. 4, 15. Ay, ay, ay. And it says like this. That we, henceforth, be more children tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight, oh, wait a minute, is that the one? Yeah, sight of man, cunning craftiness, whereby lie in the weight. Wait a minute. It's Ephesians. No, this is King James. 4.15, yeah. Ah, I knew that. See, I was just testing you guys. Make sure you. Okay, let's get back to work. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, Ephesians 4.14, 4, see, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now, uh, I, I chose these uh, scriptures simply because, listen, uh, the question is, how do we grow? That's a valid question. How do we grow? This is the year of growth. And I'm telling you that if I wish, it was too late now, but I wish that I could have had the opportunity when I was a younger man to come into this truth. Man, it amazes me that the Lord called me. Well, at least I was so silly, and I wasn't paying attention to nothing or nobody. But uh, somebody came and witnessed to me, and they gave me the truth. And when I did receive that truth, I ran with it. And so I need to grow. We all need to grow. So God wants us to grow. The thing is, your our Lord goal is for you to mature and develop the characteristics of our Lord and Savior. Do you agree with that? Sadly, however, there are millions of Christians grow older but never grow up. That's sad, isn't it? We grow old, but we don't grow up. And and, and they, they stuck in, in a perpetual Spiritual infancy, wow. remaining in diapers, goo goo ga ga. Help me, somebody. They don't grow. They want their diapers changed. The reason is that they never intended to grow. This is the year. Did we not say? They never intended to grow. Let me say this. 
If we don't grow now, when you get older, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. Spiritual growth is not automatic. It just doesn't happen like that. It takes intentional commitment. Did you hear what I said? It takes commitment. You must want to grow. It's imperative that you do grow because for you young ladies, you better grow quick in Christ because the slick willies are running around. Men, you better get going in this because there's a lot of slick Janes around. <laughs> Did I say it right? You got to protect you. You got to grow. And so you have to decide to grow. Make an effort to grow. Persist in growing. Discipleship. The process becoming like Jesus. Because when you become like him, there is nobody that is going to come and try to take your heart and stomp on it like you nothing. You ain't hear me. We better grow. We better grow. And it begins with a decision. Jesus calls us and we must respond. Come be my disciples, Jesus said unto him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Simple. This is why, oh my God, this is why. So many tragedies and, and horrifying stories of people that had the opportunity to grow and did not. How sad. You continue to live defeated. You continue to live in a way that the devil is laughing at you. I'm trying to tell you, we better grow. When the first disciples chose to follow Jesus, they didn't even understand all the implications of their decision. Let me say this. Commitment, commitment is an act, not a word. Oh, I'm committed. Are you, wait a minute. Is, is, it, is it an act in your behalf or is it just a word that you want to say to keep everybody at bay? Huh? But they simply responded to Jesus' invitation. That's all you need to get started. Decide to become a follower of Jesus. That's a decision. We have to make that decision. I'm telling you, this is real stuff right here. This is real. You understand me? This is real. This is not a play. This is not a social club. This is, this is real. This is life, man. So you have to make a decision to become a disciple. Your life is in shambles because you are running from God. Your life is in shambles because you don't want to grow. You want that diaper change. Nothing shapes your life more than commitment you choose to make. This is why marriage is so powerful. Because you have two people from two different mentalities and, and two pieces. Now, the two pieces is not perfect. It's, it's like a puzzle, see? And it has to fit perfectly. You understand me? has to fit perfectly. You know why? Because the things that my wife may, may not, uh, in my, well, I don't think that way, but some people say, well, what, my wife sometimes she drives me crazy or my husband drives me. Well, that's, that's for you. Call it a blessing. If he's a knucklehead, well, deal with the knucklehead so that you could learn something from Knuckleheadville. Yes. Ooh, knuckleheadville, where, where? You hear me, are you? You learn from that because you made a commitment. 
But let me get back to this because <laughs> I never heard of that one, Knuckleheadville. But anyway, it's all right. You made a commitment. Your commitments can develop you or they can destroy you. Depends how you look at it. Now, you're not going to sit here and take punishment. You're not going to do that. And you shouldn't do that. Because you are a precious individual. Perfectly and wonderfully made. There is no man or woman that could come and take your life and mess it up. If God made that puzzle this way, he wants to come and, and, and make it straight. God didn't do that, did he? He didn't. He made us the way we are. So that I could learn from that. You can learn from that. So either it will destroy you or it will develop you. Hello? It will either define you or not. So tell me what you are committed to and I'll tell you what you will be in 20 years from now. What are you committed to? Your job? There's no employment in the other side. You're committed to your job. You're committed to whatever it is that flutters through your brain. Somebody help me here. What are you committed? Five years from now, it's going to show what you have been committing to. And it's called nothing. Did I say it right? It'll show. Because five years from now, you shouldn't be where you are today. I'm talking about growth here. We become whatever we are committed to. What are you committed to? If you're committed to Jesus, I'm telling you, everything you touch, he'll bless it. Anyone you hold in your life will be blessed as well. Because you're committed to a, our mighty and majestic and powerful God. It is a point of commitment that most people miss God's purpose for the, in their lives. Many are afraid to commit to anything and purpose in their, for their lives. Why are you so afraid? I'd like to know. You're afraid of responsibility. Because if you commit yourself to God, you got to be here. You got to pay your tithes and offering, baby. Did I say it right? It's not for me. I don't need your money. Believe that. God doesn't need your money. This is for you, for your discipline. For your discipline. That's it. But if your money is more important to you, then please keep it. Because when you leave this planet, you might take it with you. I don't know. Yeah, right. Hmm. So others make half-hearted commitments to uh, just drift through life. You understand? They just, just got to make, just drift. Others make uh, these decisions, but they get frustrated. Frustration sets in. And all of a sudden, others make a full commitment of world just because becoming wealthy or famous and end up disappointed and bitter at the end. I think it was Will Smith that they did a interview with. He says, man, I got everything. I got everything. If I want to buy a, a, a yacht, I got it. I mentioned I got it. But after I got all this, what else? That's what he said in the interview. So that lets me to know that worldly possessions is good. That's fine. But it doesn't fill that empty void, that spiritual void. 
Only God can do that. You understand me? Some people say, well, you know, look at this guy. A multi-million jumped from the uh, skyscraper there in Los Angeles, committed suicide. His name was, I think his last name was Black. Filthy rich man. But see, God created us to worship him. That void that we are fighting all the time. Why me? Why me? That void is for you to take it and say, God, please fill it. Fill it because I need something in the spiritual dimension. I need it. Every choice has eternal consequences. So you better choose wisely. Did you hear what I say? You better choose wisely. First Peter or Second Peter three eleven. Well, let me just get it there real quick. I got time, do I? Go to First uh, Second Peter chapter three, and go with me to verse eleven. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting into the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Therefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. An account that is long suffering for our, of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, had written unto us. Verse 16. As also in all the epistles, speaking in them, that these things in which are some things hard to be understood, they, that they, that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. <sighs> unto their own destruction. Peter's warning us. Did you hear what I'm saying? Peter's warning us. The apostle Peter. Christ's likeness is a result of making Christ-like choices and depending on the Spirit to help you fulfill those choices. What choice have you made to grow, to excel in Christ? What choices? You say, are you upset? No, I'm not. I'm hurt. I'm hurt because I see brethren that have such potential and they're throwing away their potential. They're throwing it away. Saying, well, whatever. There is no whatever. Handle your business. God's been good to us. I say he's been good to us. Once you decide to get serious about becoming like Jesus and to grow in him, you must begin to act in new ways. Stop acting the way you're acting today. It's not profitable. It's not, it's not pleasing. So think now. You got to think because you made a commitment. Huh? Yes, you did. You will need to go to some old routine, develop some new habits, and intentionally change the way you think. You got to think differently. God help me. I really have to really think and understand that my job is to prepare you, brethren, for glory. That's my job. It's nobody else's job. It's my job. My calling in life is so that you could be Christ-like. How about that? Commit something to your God. 
It was character that, that, that got us out of bed this morning. Character got you out of bed. Commitment moved us into action. Now we're moving. We're doing something. And discipline that enables us to follow through and whatever comes your way. You are disciplined or you're not. What are you? You ain't hear me. Unless commitment is made, there are only promises and hopes, but no plans. <laughs> yeah, we may say, oh, yeah, I think, I'm, yeah, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to be all right. Yep. Lord, I, I'm going to, yep. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow comes, the sun shines. And you're back to the same old, same old. I need help right here. No plans. There is no plans because there's no commitment. You want to have a successful, I'm going to go this way to the left or to the right. But if you want a successful marriage, you better commit to that relationship. Not 50, not even 99%, 100%. You got to commit to that in order for it to work. Same thing applies with Jesus. You got to commit 100%. So that it'll work. So it'll start working. So then you'll be able to be used of God. Because right now we're useless. But when we commit to him, God can use us. He could, he could use us in the, in the miraculous arena. Huh? Oh, yeah. See, the thing is that, that really is frustrating is that we have the potential. Greater works shall ye do. And the world is suffering right now because God's people are anemic. We're falling apart. Well, God used those pieces if you let them. Somebody help me now. Once you have committed, you need to you need the discipline and hard work to get you there. You think it's easy? You think it's easy when you make a commitment? Man, you, you're going to fast when you don't want to fast. Yes, sir. You're going you're gonna to pray when you feel like you don't want to pray. You're going to study the word of God when you feel like you just want to lay down and sleep. That's commitment. Sacrifice. And yet... We continue with the same mentality. You leave the house of God and you go right back to the same mess. You don't know what your abilities are until you make a full commitment to develop them, man. How can you know what abilities, what talents, what 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 Blessings that God has placed in your life. If you don't allow him. Let him develop it. Let him develop it. See somebody may say. Oh you're picking on us. No I'm not picking on no, I'm, I love you. That's why I have to bring. And, and, and this is the year of growth anyway. This is the year. We got to grow. Got to get rid of that old routine. Routine. You become certain that the Holy Ghost will help you with these changes. Well, I pray he does. But you got to ask. And you got to be sincere. Mm -hmm. Philippians 12, um, uh, tw uh, chapter 2. Oh, Lord, help me here. Uh, I usually put something in so I'll make sure that I don't waste time. But chapter 2 of Philippians and verse number 12. Therefore, my beloved, he loves us. As ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. This verse shows the two-part of spiritual growth. 
Let me tell you what they are. Number one, it says work out. And the other one is work in. <laughs> the workout is your responsibility to work it out. <clears throat> to work in is God's role to work in. But we got to do our part. Spiritual growth is a collaboration between you and the Holy Ghost. The Lord's Spirit works with us, not just in us. Huh? So these verse between, to, uh, written to us as believers, it's not written to the world. It's written to us. It, 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 it's written for us. It, it's not about how to be saved. It's how to grow. To grow, brethren. Come on, huh? We got to grow. We got to grow. It does not say work for salvation. Did it say that? Because you, 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 you can't add anything to what Jesus already did. During a physical workout, you exercise to develop your body, not to get a body. You work what you got. You start building muscles, man. So it's not about getting another body, it's working the one you have already. When you work out, a puzzle always have a, all the pieces. Your task is to put them together. That's your task. You already have all the pieces. Yeah. Farmers work the land, not to get the land, but to develop what they already have. You understand? They're not working. They want to develop fruits, vegetables, whatever it is that they're planting. They, they're developing it. So the Lord has given you a new life. Now you are responsible to develop that with fear and trembling. With fear and trembling. That means to take your spiritual growth seriously. And we're not, I'm sorry, please, I want you to understand. We got to get this, we got to understand. This is serious stuff. This is serious stuff. serious stuff that means to take your spiritual growth seriously when people are casual about their spiritual growth, it shows they don't understand the eternal implications about all of it but somewhere you're going to have to suffer I'm sorry you know I learned so much about the eagle. You know, the eagle live up to 70 years of age. 70 years the eagle lives. But when they hit the age of 40, their beak gets all distorted and they won't be able to catch anything. So, and their nails, they just start getting weak and they won't be able not strong enough they won't be able to grab a hole of a prey and their feathers become heavy and it's hard for them to soar so they have a decision the eagle has a decision to make either the, the eagle says well I'm just going to die and forget about it a very difficult decision or they have another choice They will go into the mountain top. And there for 150 days, they beat their beak on a rock. For 150 days, they beat their beak on the rock until it comes off. It's painful, I bet you. 150 days beating on their beak on a rock and then 
They have to wait now for the beak to start growing. But it, and when it grows, it grows strong. Perfect angle, you know, to catch. Perfect, and it grows. When it grows, they start to pluck their, their nails, their claws. That's painful. They pluck them down. They just take them all off. Now they wait for those claws to come out. But they come out strong, perfect angle, I mean, perfect. Once they get that, then they start using their be- the new beak to pull those feathers out. And once that happens, they get new feathers, and those feathers are light. And guess what happens? They're brand new. They got another 30 years to live. Another 30 years to go hunting. 30 years to do their thing. Isn't that amazing? And I'm here to tell you, brethren, that sometimes we have to go through some painful changes. We have to go through some things that we don't want to go through. But God says, you need to go through it. You got to go through some pain. Some changes have to be made now so that you can live more powerful. That eagle lifted his wings and took off. And he was strong. Brand new beak. Great claws. Light because he plucked all those heavy feathers. And now he's a brand new bird. Strong, you hear? But it costs them pain now. We don't want pain. We we don't want no pain, do we? We want everything to be copacetic, nice. We got to go through some pain if you want to change. Somebody help me here. God always has... Have two choices, your commitment versus your fears. Your commitment versus your fears. What are you fearful? You're fearful because you don't want pain. Leave me alone. Listen to me. The eagle was so powerful that the crow is the only bird. You can check this out. The only bird that jumps on the back of the of the eagle and begins to bite and peck on his back, the back of the neck of the uh, uh, of the eagle. The eagle is powerful. The eagle could swing it around and maybe grab him and tear him up. But you see, it's just a little ugly little crow. I ain't gonna bother with this fella. So you know what he does? The eagle takes off. Way up there, high and high, and here's a crow holding on to his life. And all of a sudden, there's no oxygen because the crow can't handle the the the, the you know the, the height. And guess what happens? The crow falls off and dies. And the and the eagle says, "You know who you ain't. You don't know who you're messing with." But we allow little things to bother us. And instead of soaring and giving God praise, we begin to try and get get away from me, man. Soar. As you lift up your hands and soar into the presence of God. And all those little things that are plaguing you, those little things that you've been holding on to, they're going to fall off. You ain't hear me. They're going to fall off. A major part of loving the Lord is commitment. If we are committed to Jesus, if we are committed to loving him, it's not, it's not possible for us to fall out of love with him. Did you hear what I said? It's impossible. It's impossible to fall out of love with God. But you got to go through the trance. To, to the transformation. 
There's pain, brethren. I didn't get to where I'm at today because everything was great. <laughs> I fought. I fought. I fought. And I understood my fight. I understood my God. I understood who I was. It was painful. But guess what? When it was all said and done, I came out victorious in Christ Jesus. Do you hear what I say? Oh, yes, I did. I came out strong. But we don't want to. We, we just leave me alone, preacher. Just change my diapers and feed me some baby food and just let me go. You can't do that. And some people will leave the church and they get angry at me. And I don't even know why. I don't know why. All I know is that love compels us to do what we're supposed to do. To change your life, you must change your way of thinking. That's why we don't grow. Did you hear what I say? You got to stop, stop thinking the way you've been thinking. Be, behind everything you do is a thought. Every behavior is motivated by a belief. And every action is prompted by an attitude. God revealed this thousands of years before psychologists understood that. Be careful for how you think in Proverbs 4.23. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Did you hear what I said? Be careful how you think. Be careful. Pay attention. And so what happens is, Imagine riding in a speedboat on a lake and, and, and an automatic pilot set uh, to go east, let's say. If you decide to reverse and, and head west, you have to do, you, you have to, uh, possible ways to change the boat's direction. One way is to grab the steering wheel and physically force it uh, to head the direction that you want it to uh, go. Uh, and, and then program it. Or you just keep let it go. Where you where you wind up, only you will know. Only God knows. Only He will know. Only you will know. But you created this scenario. You because you were not thinking rationally. You were thinking Carnally, could I say? Physically. And so, willpower, you could overcome, but you would feel constant resistance. There would be a constant resistance. And, you, and, and brethren, let me tell you that our, your arms would eventually tire of the stress of holding that thing, of trying to turn it. Your arms will hurt and you become stressed because you can't turn that thing around. This is what happens when you try to change your life with willpower. You say, I'll force myself to eat less. I force, notice the wording, I will force myself. I'm going to force myself not to think of her. I'm going to force myself not to think of her, of him. I'm going to force myself. Well, your willpower can produce short-term change, short change, but it creates constant eternal stress with, because you aren't dealt with you are not dealing with the root of the cause, with the root of the problem. 
And the root of the problem is you're, you just are not willing to change. You're not willing to, to deal with whatever it is that comes your way because you want everything to be copacetic, everything nice. Change doesn't feel natural, so eventually you give up, okay? You want it so easy. Everything's got to be easy. Nothing is easy. Whatever is easy, you better question. There is a better and easier way. Change your way of thinking, the way you think. The Bible says, let God transform you into a new person. Let him do it. See, your change, change your thoughts, change your life. I say, change your thoughts. Change your thoughts and your life will change. But if you don't, then my goodness, you just headed, oh my God, you just headed for disaster. Change your vision. Change your decisions. What is your vision anyway? Oh, I don't have, you don't have one. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. But what is your vision? What do you want to accomplish, say, two years from now? Where do you want to be in two years? Think about it for a minute. Just go with me. What do you want to do two years from now? What is your vision? To change your decision? We're not thinking rationally. We're not. By changing the way you think, your first step is spiritual growth. It's to start changing the way you think. Change always starts first in your mind because that's where the enemy attacks. Did you hear me? That's why the Bible says in Romans 12, by the renewing. That's right. But you see what I'm saying here? Change always starts in your mind. The way you think determines the way you feel. What are you feeling? And the way you feel influences the way you act. Well, I don't feel good today. So everybody's going to pay for it. I don't know. Help me out with that. The apostle Paul said, there must be a spiritual renewal in your thoughts and attitude. I'm paraphrasing, but this is basically what he's saying. And so to be like Jesus, you must develop the mind of Christ. A New Testament calls this mental shift. Well, you know what it's called? It's called repentance. That's the shift. We don't want to repent. So you just did something you shouldn't have done, but you did it anyway. But you, you run from repenting because you know you're going to do it again tomorrow. You get my picture? So you keep, you keep go looking. Now, I don't want to look back over there because if you look back, you have a responsibility to deal with that. It's called repentance. And if you repent wholeheartedly, you will not do the same thing. But you don't want to repent because you know you're going to do the same thing. Talk to me. In the Greek, literally means to change your mind. Repentance, change your mind. Change it. What's the problem? You repent whenever you change the way you think by adopting how God thinks about yourself and about sin that you're committing. See, that's why I'm not a popular preacher. That's all right. I got to preach the Bible. This is the year of growth. We got to grow. We got to grow. 
We got to start changing our attitudes. We got a bad attitude. I'll do whatever I want. Heck with it. Well, you're going to pay for that. Eventually, you're going to pay for that. And so, the thing that gets me is that God and other people, well, forget about that because that doesn't really matter. It matters what you do with what God has put in your life. It matters what you do with other people because let me tell you something. We are, we, we, when we love people, we compliment our God. Can I say right? So we are commanded to think the same way Jesus thought. When it's not a, a it, we were commanded. There are two parts of doing this. The first half of this mental shift is to stop thinking immature thoughts. <laughs> oh my God. Why are you entertaining garbage? Why? It's not profitable. It, it doesn't do anything for you. Talk to me. There's nothing about it. Immature stuff. That doesn't add up to nothing. And then... Self-centered and self-seeking. The Bible says stop thinking like children. In regard to evil infant, be, be infants. Evil be infants. But in your thinking. Be, by, be adults. Babies. Babies. Are not capable. Of giving. Only receiving. Babies are there to receive. You've got to feed it. You've got to change. You've got to do all that. If you don't, they perish. Am I all right? And sometimes we have that mentality. And so that is immature thinking. Unfortunately, many people never grow beyond that kind of thinking. It's all about what gratifies me. Give me, give me, even though my name ain't Jimmy. Give me. I want some. Take care of me. That is childish thinking. Somebody help me now. Those who live following their sinful selves think only about things that their sinful selves want. You want attention from boys. You want attention from women. You want all this attention. You don't realize that by trying to get this attention, you're going to pay the price. The second half of thinking like Jesus is to start thinking Maturely, which focuses on others, not yourself. Huh? Paul concluded that thinking of others is the mark of maturity. If you see a, 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 a sister or if you see a brother that is going the wrong way, you got to stop him. You got to say, hey, something. You got to say something. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish things away. I got to think. Life is short. You don't have no guarantee for tomorrow. Today, many assume for spiritual maturity is measured by the amount of biblical information and doctrine you know. I'm sorry. It don't work that way. Huh? Or Knowledge. Don't work that way. Before you can change your life for the better, you have to change your thoughts for the better. You got you to gotta change. You become what you digest into your spirit, whatever you think about. What are you thinking anyway? 
Can I tell you, sometimes we think about stuff that is totally disconnected. We focus on things that we shouldn't be focusing on. Read about things that we shouldn't be reading. Talk about things that we shouldn't be talking about. You go into a track more of in, uh, 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 into your life, make sure you're all, they're all godly thoughts. Because if you don't, you're going to give room to the enemy to start throwing some garbage cans in you. Yep. You can change your mind. Can you, wait a minute, can you, there's a question, can you, can you change your mind? If you can't, it's not you're doing the thinking. You're adopting someone else's viewpoint in your life. Oh, you all right. You ain't got to worry about nothing. Them folk crazy in that church house. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah, you know you're right. You, you mean to tell me you go to church Sunday and Wednesday? You don't see your mind. Well, yeah. Come on, man. Come on. And now you adopt what they're entertaining and you pick it up. You adopt it. That's amazing to me. Did I say right? It amazes me. If you don't get it together now, by the time you're 30, 20, what, 20, 30, 40, you're going to be a mess. Believe me. You're going to be a complete mess of ruski. <laughs> you ain't going to know what's going up or down. However, I can't change my past. You can't change your past. You can't. I wish we could. I wish somebody would invent the time machine. Man, I'd, I'd be the first in line. Here's my ticket. <laughs> I would change things. And if I could just go back in the future, what I know now, man, I'd be all right. You yeah. know? I mean, I've baptized hundreds of people. I have done hundreds of Bible studies. I've done all. But could you imagine what more I could have done? If someone would have loved me enough to tell me. Does anybody hear me? So I can't change the past. I can't even predict my future, nor can you. But I tell you one thing, you can shape your present. You can shape your now. You can begin to shape it now. You can make up your mind now and say, you know what? Uh-uh. Devil, get you away from me. Because I got a different mindset. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do for the glory of God. Talk to me here. For the glory of God, I'm going to do something different. Help me, Lord. There are so many challenges, but the first closest and the biggest challenge is your mindset. What are you thinking? Again, you could walk out of here, and you probably don't even remember what I spoke about today. You may not even look at the video, but I have fulfilled my part. I've done, I have done what I was told to do. But somewhere you have a responsibility for you. Somewhere you're going to have to get a hold of you. If you change your mind, you have to change your actions as well. You got to change your way of doing things. Huh? You got to change your, 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 your demeanor. You got to change it, man. Change it. I truly believe that if we have one more, if we have more control over our mindset, 
then we think we tend to let feelings of frustration, negativity creep into our head and slowly take control over our mindset and our actions. But remember this, it is up to us to what thoughts we let into our brain is your responsibility, not mine, is yours. You understand that? It's yours. We're not mentally challenged. We're intelligent people. You have a responsibility to say, enough, devil, enough. I know who I am. And I know what I'm supposed to do. So get behind me. Please help me. While knowledge is one of our measurements of maturity, it isn't the whole story. In the Christian life, is far more than creeds and conviction. It includes conduct and character. And I'm going to throw some integrity in there too. Our deeds must be consistent with our creeds and, and our beliefs must be backed up with Christ-like behavior. Are you behaving like Jesus? Are you talking like him? You know, this, this thing with the eclipse, everybody's freaking out. I got a call from different parts of the country. I won't say where. And they're all freaking out. What you freaking out for? Just don't look up there. That's all. That's all you got to do. <laughs> don't look up there with a naked eye. That's all you got to do. Don't worry about nothing. Yeah, but it's, it's the Bible says, I said, I know what the Bible says. In the book of Luke, in the book of uh, Joel, I understand what the Bible says. But let me tell you this. We're too worrying. We're worried so much about signs then we are worried about what is happening here. The eclipse, please. Good God. I didn't even know it went by. My grandson had to tell me, oh, yeah, it happened a while back ago. They're here. <laughs> See, we worry. We, we, we look at signs. Start looking at you. Start looking deep in here. Who are you? Are you pleasing the Lord? Yes or no? Are you allowing people to stomp all over you? Let me think. That's on you. Because if you know how to pray, you better learn to pray and fix that problem. You could complain all day long. But you don't know. No, I don't know, but I do know my Jesus. And I know that if you commit yourself fully, he will hear you. He will remove or he will fix the problem. You ain't hear me. You ain't hear me. So why complain so much? Get on your knees like a real child of God. Think positive and say, God, I'm not going to deal with this staggers no more. I can't deal with it. Too much. It hurts too much. Just come on. Pray. Talk to me. And I will remove it or I'll fix it. That's the way it works. I'm sorry. You don't like it? Send me a letter. That's the way it works. We got to start thinking in the spiritual, not in the carnal. But, but you don't understand. I do understand because I'm human like you. I do understand. But if something is afflicting me, I'm not going to just sit there and let, come on, come on, keep on. No, I'm going to stop. I'm going to look at my problem. And I'm going to say, in the name of Jesus, 
fix it or move it. In Jesus' name. Period. That's it. Get on your knees and pray. Get on your knees and pray. That's maturity. Christianity is not a religion or a philosophy, but a relationship, a lifestyle. You hear me? It's a lifestyle. And this lifestyle tells me what I can and cannot do. I'm not going to be a prisoner. I'm not going to be a whipping stone, a whipping uh, a post for anybody. I'm not a, I'm not a rose of people go walk all over me. Mm -mm. No, sir. I am a valued human being. I value me. Because he that dwells in me is the almighty. Come on now. But we are allowing people in their ignorance to dagger me? I don't think so. I don't think so. So do something about it. Start thinking right. And get on your knees. Because when you couple prayer with love, God will do the right thing. Did you hear what I say? You love just couple it with your prayer. And whatever you touch, God will honor. Oh, yeah. So, it's not a religion. The core of that lifestyle is thinking of others as Jesus did instead of ourselves. I don't have to go to you and tell you anything. I don't have to say, you know, I've been praying for you. I don't have to tell you that. I don't have to tell you that. He knows. He knows. I don't have to come and say, you know what, brother? I'm praying that, uh, you understand? I don't have to go there. I just pray. And, you, and then when I see God moving, all I do is I lift my hand and say, thank you, Jesus. That's all. But we make everything so difficult. You know why? Because we, are, we somehow, it's hard to let go. We're so prone to being beat up mentally, physically, emotionally, whatever. We're so prone to that that we just, well, whatever. There is no whatever. Stand up like a man. Stand up like a woman and declare, this is not acceptable. I'm not going to have it in Jesus' name. How about that? How about that? Think differently. Discipline yourself. Commit yourself unto God. Oh my God, help me here. The Bible says we should think of their good and try to help them by doing what pleases them. Even Christ did not try to please himself. So thinking of others is the heart of being a Christian. Thinking of others. If I know you're hurting, I got a responsibility. If I love you, now, I pray for you. You understand what I'm saying here? If I say I love you, I'll pray that God will begin the process. That's all I do. But you have to join in too. So this kind of thinking is unnatural, countercultural, rare, difficult maybe. Unfortunately, we have help. God has given us his spirit. That's why we don't think the same way that people of the world think. 
We don't think like that. You know, you know how they think? Well, you know, he's a piece of trash. She ain't no good. Whatever. That's not the way we think. We have to think the way he thinks. Thinking, thinking godly. Are you hearing me so far? Look at the tools that the Holy Ghost uses to help us grow. It's never too late to start growing. Today is the day. It's up to you. It's up to you. Today is the day. Let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. You got to start thinking godly. You got to start thinking victoriously. You got to start thinking maturely. And then as you begin to think, God opens the doors and you will say, wow, look, it's happening. Wow. I can't believe it. No, no, believe it. Because if this, if what I'm saying to you here is not real, then I'm going to close my Bible, give it back to Sister Kathy and walk out of here. I will. But it's real. This is real. But it has to start with you. Not me. It has to start with you. You got to make a change. You got to commit. You got to grow. Because if you don't, you will pay the price down the road. Change your mind. You will be able to know the will of God. Do you hear what I say? What is the one area where I need to stop thinking my way and start thinking God's way? Your way is not working. <laughs> your way ain't panning out. So might as well stop that. Uh, you're wasting your time. Your way ain't working. It's not working. So whatever we plant in our subconscious mind and nourish with repetition and emotion will one day become reality. So whatever it is that you have been entertaining in your mind is going to come to pass. Did you hear what I say? If you think for one minute that whatever you're entertaining in your mind is not going to come to pass, uh, I'll sell you a bridge in, 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 in Rockford. Cheap. Huh? Whatever you entertain in your mind eventually will come into reality. And then you want to cry about it. You created it. You did it. You created something and, and it became and it materialized. You've got to win in your mind before you win in your life. I'm telling you. Got to win in your mind first and foremost. If you don't win here, you're not going to win nowhere. We may, we may come to church and shout and holler. And that's fine. But the test is when you leave these four walls. That's the test. Because somebody's going to make you mad. Somebody's going to say something ill. Something, somebody's going to just get you upset. And now you got to stop and say, wait a minute. Hold up. I just heard the preacher. Wait a minute. I'm doing the opposite. Wait, what's up? Because you're not thinking. You cannot have a positive life and a negative mind at the same time. Are you kidding me? Oh, somebody help me now. Listen, I'm, a, I'm a fixing to close here. Because as I told you and I said it and I'll say it again. Whenever I bring anything to the church house, I take it for me. It, I, I preach it to me first. 
because I don't know. Maybe I'm too busy, and I don't realize that there's a little bug creeping inside of me because I'm too busy. No, 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 no. I examine me. I, I, this is what you want, Lord, for your people. I have to look at it, and I have to eat it. First, and if there's anything in me that is not right, I got to get on my knees and say, God, help me. I can't deliver this with dirty hands. I can't. I have to look at me and say, God, even, even before I came up, even before Elder uh, gave me the pulpit, I, 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 I said, Lord, help me. Help me. Remember, everything is created twice. First in your mind, and then in reality. But it starts here. And if you begin to entertain hate, you're going to be hating for a long time. But if you entertain love and acceptance, and forgiveness and understanding. That's what's going to develop. Because I don't worry about them. I have to worry about me. You understand what I'm saying? I hope I'm not throwing a... I have to worry about me. I have to worry. Is, am I right in your eyes, Jesus? Am I all right with you? But brethren, if you don't grow spiritually, you know what's going to happen to us? We'll begin to shrink, shrimp, shrink. Yes. <laughs> I thought about shrimp right there, you know. <laughs> but if you, don't, if you don't grow spiritually, you will shrink spiritually. And that's the problem that we're facing in our churches today, we're shrinking because we're not learning how to grow. And I'm going to wrap it up with this thought. The main requirement for spiritual growth is a yearning to know who you really are. Did you hear what I say? I'm going to repeat it again. The main requirement for spiritual growth is the yearning to know who you are, who I am. Because that's pivotal. That's important. You could, you could, you could, you could look as holy as you can. Or you could smell holy all day long. You could look so holy, people will go like this. Ooh. It doesn't cut it. Doesn't cut it. Who are you? Does Jesus approve you? Does he say, well done? Does he say, I'm proud of you? Okay. Anyway, thank you for borrowing me your ears. Shall we stand? In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Thank you. Thank you, God. For your mercy. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Take us home safely, oh God. Bring us back Sunday, oh my oh Lord, so that we could give you praise and glory. But let this couple of days prior to Sunday, let it be a time so that we could reflect. And really examine ourselves and see, are we really who we think we are? 